foggy country road at night, you could just see the particles ahead of you disappear. There was nothing you could make out. And then he's the stranger saying, can you see my hand? Can you see my hand? I, I focused on this, his voice and then saw the hand, and he was waving down to your floor level, sort of caught behind a wall. His, his, he sort of punched a little hole in the wall, and I could see his eyes behind the hole, and his arm was sticking out. Removed a bunch of debris my side of the wall, and he pulled himself back into his little cave, if you like, and, and I stood a desk up on the outside of this wall, which we couldn't move, couldn't get around it or anything. And um, I looked down into the pit, you know, where he was, and I said, you must come up this wall. Um, you must do it. He jumped. I missed him the first time. The second time I hooked around him and heaved him up and over the wall. He fell on top of me, gave me a big kiss, and I said, I'm Brian. And he said, I'm Stanley. We'll be brothers for life. So we... Uh, we dusted ourselves off, and with my flashlight, made our way back to the stairs. And then, I guess, was the fateful decision. I shone the light down the stairs, and, and I just wanted to test it. I wanted to see what that lady was talking about with the flames that she said were down below and, and we couldn't pass through. And Stanley and I began to dig through debris, and uh, because the stairs clearly had fallen in a little bit more after the lady had come up. Because, right. Because uh, it was now debris on the stairs, and we dug through it on the 78th floor, which was... We learned later the center point of the impact. Um, there, there were some flames sort of flickering up the other side of the cracked wall, but it wasn't a raging inferno. I'm sure the, the flames were just starved for oxygen in the interior. And uh, we dug a little further, and on the 74th floor, we broke into fresh air. Uh, the lights were on. The air was coming from below, and uh, the only abnormality was there was maybe a half an inch to an inch of water cascading down the stairs underfoot. And you, the rest of the way down, literally ran into no one else? We passed one person only. Um, in, in our entire descent, we didn't overtake anybody, and right. nobody overtook us, and there were no police or firemen coming up the stairs. However, on the 68th floor, um, walking up the stairs, was a co-worker of mine, Jose Marrero. And Jose was on our fire safety team as well, carrying a walkie-talkie, as did several of the other guys on the fire safety team. And I said, Jose, where are you going? What are you doing? He said, I'm going up to help Dave Vera. I can hear him on the walkie-talkie. He's helping people. I'm going up to help him. And I said sort of feebly, uh, well, I'm getting this fellow from Fuji Bank out. And he said, well, I'll be okay. And up he went. And, of course, Jose died that day. He's kind of my hero. He really is. You know, I, I was going to bring up his name because I'd heard you talk about him before. I, You know, we'd all like to think we do that. And, of course, this is the number of folks who did what – Jose did and just said, I, hey, I, I'm going to help more yep. people. We all like to think we would do it, but it's, it's pretty inspirational stuff, is it not? Oh, and, well, it's, 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 it's remarkable. You know, that, that's, that's courage and bravery. You know, what I did was, was uh, you know, sort of instinctive, just react to, to what's in front of me and, 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 and did what I did at that moment. Would I do it again the next time? I have no idea. But Jose, with a clear thought said, there are people in trouble, I am, I'm going to help them. I'm okay, I can assist. And, I mean, that's, that's heroism, in my, in my opinion. The, you know, the, there's, there's times where folks talk about, we see movies about this, books about this, when folks survive tragedies of various sorts, whether we're talking about crashes or we're talking about a terrorist acts like this, of feeling guilty that they survived. Mm -hmm. Do you have that? Do you get that emotion? Um, I thank you for the question. I have been asked that a lot, and, and I, my response is I have absolutely been given a gift, and I I'm, I'm, will be eternally grateful for it, um, and I can't explain it. I take no credit for it, but I do not have any survivor guilt whatsoever. I, I don't dwell on 9-11 on a daily basis. I have not had one nightmare, not one, about the event. My head hits the pillow and I fall asleep. Um, it's a gift. And I'm and I'm grateful. Um, can't explain it. You know, co -work, some coworkers of mine um, kind of dissolved. They they couldn't come back to work. Um, it, it was you know they're not in a happy place even today. 9/11 uh, survivor Brian Clark is our guest on the fan. Working, he worked in the 84th floor of the South Tower. The second tower hit. The first tower to come down. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And give us a little bit. Well, you and Stanley, you're out of the building at 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 it's at one point. Your guys are talking about. You're kind of looking up, and I believe Stanley says something to the effect of, "I, you know, I think this thing might come down." He, he did. We we had been out of the building about four minutes, 
and we're down a block and a half south uh, on the south side of Trinity Church. And Stanley turned more that we were walking, you know, we were actually intending to go into the church, but we were walking on the south side of the church up, up the hill toward Broadway. And Stanley stopped, and he turned more than 90 degrees around and to his left and, and looked up at the south tower. And just from that vantage point, the south tower actually blocked our view of the north tower. We could just see the tower we had come out of. And he said, you know, I think that tower could come down. And he grabbed onto the railing of the cemetery. And I, and I said, you know, with all my clever knowledge, I said, there's no way. That's a steel structure. That's just carpets and furniture and drapery burning. And I really didn't finish that sentence when way up at the top, we could see the little wobble in the top of the building and then the sort of the boom, boom, boom as each floor pancaked on itself. And down it went in a horrendous whoosh um, and some explosions, you know, as the gases in the, in the, in the uh, piping um, compressed and then exploded as it collapsed. We could only see that, you know, we, we missed the bottom 20%, 25%. Trinity Church, if you like, blocked our view of it, but we knew what had happened as this thing dissolved. But Trinity Church acted also like a, a protection because the, the white guck that came out of that place uh, when it came down it hit Trinity Church, and just like a seawall, you know, the energy of that wave hit Trinity Church and exploded upward. And there was Stanley and I again protected in this area of calm and fresh air. We then, uh, knowing that it was about to fall on us, the, the white uh, wave, we ran up a few yards to Broadway and ran south on Broadway. As the wave caught up to us, we at random just dove into 42 Broadway as the as the wave passed. And we were in that building with a bunch of strangers and, and talking for another 45 minutes. We didn't even know this, the North Tower came down at 10.30. We were in there for about 45 minutes. But, uh, you know, there's no communications, sure. no, no electricity. We, you know, we couldn't phone anybody. We were sort of trapped in this building hoping to breathe well for 45 minutes. Now, you mentioned that at, at one point after you're out and safe, you two get separated and that you uh, are, are, are talking about or thinking about whether was was he real, was he an angel, and of course, but you already had his business card, so you knew. Yeah, in, in, in 42 Broadway, he gave me his business card, we started to introduce ourselves and find out what our <laughs> lives were about and so on, and uh, he gave me his personal business card with his home phone number and address and his wife's name on it, and I tucked it in my shirt pocket, and then when we went out the backside of that building at about quarter to 11, um, somehow, and it wasn't densely populated, neither of us understand this to this day, we were suddenly separated. He was just not visible. He says the same thing, like, where did Brian go? And I'm thinking, where did Stanley go? And this feeling swept over me, crazy as it sounds, but I mean, I'm under some chaotic stress yes. at the time. I'm thinking, you know, there, maybe there was no Stanley. He's just a guardian angel sent me to get out of there. So I very slowly and cautiously reached in my shirt pocket hoping their business card was there, and it was, but it would be quite a story if uh, there was no business card. That's for sure. In the 10 years since, how often have you spoken or seen each other? Well, uh, there are some events that we have shared together, including my oldest daughter's wedding. He and his wife came to the wedding, and it's kind of funny, at the wedding he almost upstaged the bride because <laughs> all my friends, of course, know my daughter, but they were more interested <laughs> in meeting Stanley. Um, so, uh, but one of us calls the other one every couple of months, and you know, we catch up on family uh, happenings. Um, we certainly phone on, on birthdays, Christmas, Easter, um, and 9-11, of course. Um, so, we, but he lives quite a distance from me. We're, we're 180 degrees apart on the, on the map uh, from New York City, so it's probably an hour and a half drive to the other person's home. Um, so we don't get together that often socially, but on, on occasions we do. Do you still work in the same, for the, with the same company, the same position? No. For five years, I was president of our relief fund, raising money for our victims' families, and then five years ago, I retired. Um, Stanley does still work, but he is, he's changed uh, employers. He now works for a different bank. You know, you mentioned that you were there for the 1993 bombing. I, I'm wondering if, this, in, the, in the years that followed, was there something in the back of your mind saying, my God, this is a target you can't live your life that way, obviously, but, you know, the, the, the terrorists look for symbols, and this obviously is, is very much a symbol, at least in the eyes of, of many of them. I mean, were there days where you go, ah, that, that should have been a warning to us that uh, this ain't the safest place to work? I, I did not have that feeling. Um, I was, 
it's funny because I, I think of myself as a little bit of a political junkie and so on, and you know I enjoy I enjoy politics and current events and so on. But I really was a bit ignorant about Al Qaeda and the Taliban and so on, and so I, those thoughts really didn't enter my mind. I just thought the '93 bombing was, you know, a, a few evil guys trying to, you know, that sure. a little bit different value system than mine, and and kept it to a minimum that way. I didn't think of it as a big organization trying to do this dramatic act. What do you say, we get into uh, conversations and debates on my program over the years, I, countless times regarding an endless stream of conspiracy theories uh, mm-hmm. that, that I'm sure that you, I'm sure, are even more aware of than I. And as someone who lived it and was there, what do you say to the folks who, I mean, there's, you know, there's a couple different ones. One, of course, is that we plotted it. The U.S. actually plotted it. Another one was that we enabled it. And another one was, well, there had to have been some other explosions. It doesn't work any other way. Um, does that stuff, do you have some Do you have some understanding of that? Are you sickened by it? What, what's your reaction to what's become, uh, you know, really there's a, there's a sort of a cottage industry now, uh, 10 years later, that has cropped up regarding what did or didn't take place on 9-11. Right. Well, with today's media, you know, Internet and, and digital this and so on, um, you know, we are all so connected. So I think a small group of people can indeed, I mean, that's a good description, cottage industry, because I think it's a, it's a, it's a tiny group of people who think that, and yet when they dedicate themselves to putting that information out there, it seems like it's a bigger group than, than it is. I really don't think there are that many conspiracy um, believers. I am not one. I mean, I was there. Um, you know, we certainly saw the planes. Now, do I know 100% certain? No, I don't. But I, I just would. There's, there's too many things that would have to go uh, unannounced and, and secretively for it to happen. It's, it's virtually impossible in my mind. Well, and I think I, what's fascinating about conspiracy theorists is that what they tend to do is find the one detail that might be dif- more difficult to explain. Yep. At the and in doing so, they ignore the ninety-nine other details right. that absolutely would indicate this is precisely what happened. It's it's because in any tragedy, any any of these things, there you're not going to be able to tie up li- literally. I think every loose end, and so right. the conspiracy theorists they're just going to fixate on the one as opposed to the preponderance of evidence. I I, I think you're quite right, Brian. We appreciate uh, the time very much. I assume this is going to be a very busy week for you. <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> It's shaping up that way, yes. Um, on, on Sunday, though, I'm getting a little relief. I'm going to Stanley's Church in the morning uh, out on Long Island, so I will be seeing he and his wife that day. And then in the evening, he and his wife are coming to my church in northern New Jersey. So oh, that's terrific. We're going to have a, we're going to be together. That should be great. Well, I assume you you and your wife have uh, had uh, have relived the phone calls that are uh, the phone calls from the, the couple of phone calls I think you had from that day to indicate all's well and that you were safe. I'm sure that's come up from time to time. Well, it has, and, and it was the timing of those that was what was most disturbing at home because I called her between the two planes, told her to turn on the TV, and uh, something's happened next door, but I'm okay. And then, you know, five minutes later, mm. boom, right where I've phoned from, she sees this explosion, so that wasn't good. And then at 9.35, 25 minutes before our building collapsed, I called her from the 31st floor, and uh, said, I've got a great story to tell you. I'm okay. You know, I'm coming home. got to go. Put the phone down. She turned around and announced to our room full of people that are, you know, our home full of people who'd come to be supportive. Uh, three of my four kids came home, and, uh, and we had neighbors and friends from church and so on had come over. She then announced to the room that Brian's okay. He's on the 31st floor. He'll be out in two hours. Oh. And 25 minutes later, our, our building collapsed. Now, the reason she said that was, in 1993, coincidentally, our offices had been on the 31st floor, and it had taken me two hours to get out of the building. But that was because everybody went to the stairs and tried to mm. vacate at once. Um, so it was just totally different conditions. So when the building collapsed 25 minutes later, you know, Brian had died for a second time. And uh, I could not even call her until I got to Jersey City on a ferry boat at 11.15, so it was an hour and 15 minutes after our building collapsed that uh, was the first time I could get to her. Are you a religious man, or have you become one? I, I would, I, I, I'm an agnostic. I'm not sure if I were in your shoes that I would be any longer once I <laughs> experienced what you did. Well, I can tell you um, I had certain beliefs prior to 9-11. Uh, those beliefs have not changed, 
but they have been strengthened. So my answer to your question is yes, 